Hello and welcome to Your Town. My name is Steve Elsey. I'm the president of Your Sanctuary TV, and this program is about the sanctuary, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Today, we are very, very honored to have as our guest the superintendent of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Mr. Paul Michel. Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here as always. Oh, the, I, I love having you on the show because you are a font of knowledge, an ocean of knowledge. Um, w last time you were here, we talked about how big the sanctuary is, 6,000 square miles, and, and uh, the biggest in the continental United States. And I know on the West Coast, we've got the Olympic up in the Olympic Sanctuary up in, in uh, Washington. We've got Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, the Farallons. We've got the Monterey Bay, right. of course. And then we've got the Channel Islands right. on the West Coast alone. Right, right. How many sanctuaries are they? Are there? Yeah, well, so we have five here on the West Coast, as you just mentioned. We mm -hmm. have 13 National Marine Sanctuaries nationwide and two National Marine Monuments. Whoa. Fantastic places. I mean, these special places protect over 600,000 square miles of ocean and Great Lakes waters. That's more than all of our national parks, national forests, state forests, state parks, all combined. Truly remarkable. And, and, and that, another beautiful thing about it is so much of the sanctuaries hasn't been explored per se. That's right, that's yeah, right. So. Yeah, I, I liken it to if you were to explore Yosemite at night with a flashlight. You know, everywhere you shine your light, you're gonna find something really cool and interesting. And that's what it's like in our marine sanctuaries, vastly unexplored, but there's so much there to learn and to, to, to really understand. And now on, on the Gulf Coast uh, is Flower Garden Bank, is that correct? Flower Garden Banks are these okay. unique uh, seamounts basically that rise up off the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. They're about 80 to 100 miles offshore of Galveston, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in Florida, we have the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. So those are our presence in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, and, yeah. and Florida Keys. Now, how about the Great Lakes? There's a National Marine Sanctuary in the Great Lakes? There is. Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is a unique place because it is one of a, a few of our marine sanctuaries that are really focused on maritime heritage ah. and to protect the shipwrecks that are there. There's many shipwrecks in the Great Lakes and Thunder Bay, not many people realize this, but it <clears throat> is a scuba diving mecca. People come from all over the world to dive in Thunder Bay and Lake Huron on these wrecks. Many of them are very shallow, or even some of them are at snorkel depth. Uh, really amazing crystal clear water and just beautiful uh, surroundings and really interesting maritime heritage stories. Now, when it comes then to also to the East Coast, mm -hmm. there, there is a sanctuary uh, uh, in Chesapeake Bay? Or, or, I'm not well, there's sure. one that's proposed in Chesapeake Bay. Okay. Yeah, uh, but we have Stellwagen Bank. Stellwagen Bank. Up in Massachusetts. Okay. We also have the USS Monitor, uh, which is really just one square mile that protects mm -hmm. the USS Monitor, the Civil War era submarine that was scuttled during mm -hmm. the war. Uh, and that was actually the first National Marine Sanctuary designated. And then to the south, we have uh, Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which is offshore of Savannah, Georgia. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, is that close to the, the, the outer banks, as they call them, or is it a little bit south of A little bit of south of that, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, that is beautiful out there, too. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I just I, I, I was looking at the outer banks, a picture of the outer banks the other day, yeah. and uh, that's gorgeous, a gorgeous area I've never been to. I and a lot of shipwrecks there, a lot of shipwrecks. They, they call it the graveyard of the Atlantic, uh, and so there's a lot of interest in uh, maybe preserving some of those under National Marine Sanctuary designation in the future. Mm -hmm. And I, speaking of maritime heritage, yeah. though, uh, your website is MontereyBay.NOAA.gov. Right, all right? right. Now, just remember that, folks, MontereyBay.NOAA.gov. Uh, if you go on there and go into maritime heritage, there's a beautiful study mm -hmm. by uh, uh, Jim Delgado and several others, and I'm sorry, I can't remember their names, about Gray's Reef. And, oh, yeah. man, it is gorgeous. Yeah, it and is. some yeah. beautiful illustrations, right, right. historical things. Yes. Is that a real big responsibility of the sanctuary, that preservation of maritime heritage? Well, it's one of many. And right. uh, we really like to celebrate and tell the stories of maritime heritage mm -hmm. and maritime cultural landscapes. That is, the, our connection with the ocean, whether it's you know through maritime trade and exploration and lighthouses and shipwrecks uh, and the native peoples that lived here. It's really a, a broad story to tell. 
um, and the people, the public loves it. Uh, so that's what we do, and we do a lot of it. Uh, some of our sanctuaries I mentioned are really focused on maritime heritage. Mm -hmm. Here in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, we have some really cool stories. We did, sure. we did that one story on the USS Independence, that's the World right. War II era uh, ship that was uh, scuttled during the Bikini Atoll atomic bomb test. That's correct. And it's offshore of San Francisco. Uh, mm -hmm. Several years ago, we went to explore that. Uh, we have the USS Macon, which was the World War II era dirigible, actually even prior to World War II, uh, and it uh, sank off a of Big Sur coast in like 1935, I believe. Uh, and uh, with Mbari, we went there to, to investigate and explore that site. So there's many, many stories like this, and you can all check it out on our website. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, we did, didn't we do an episode once of your sanctuary uh, on the Macon, I think? We did Macon, uh, and we also did USS and Independence. The, and, the, and the Independence, yeah. the Mysteries of the Deep, something yeah. like right, that. Right, right, right. Yes. We were real, real filmmakers, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, Paul, bringing bringing things into a, a, a sort of more of a, a, a local feel yeah. because you, you we are, we're right here in the Monterey Bay. Um, uh, uh, well, there, there, there's a lot of talk about wildlife disturbance, right? And right. and that seems to be a hot topic. I just got to ask you right yeah, here: yeah, yeah. Is there any way we can get somebody on the on, on the show who's an expert at that, a, a, a specialist, a wildlife disturbance, uh, how to view wildlife, that type of thing? Well, I think it would be great to get Lisa Emanuelson on the show because oh. she oversees our Team Ocean and Baynet programs. And these are volunteers that work with us and under our guidance to interact with the public in, in kayaks or, or on the bike path and talking to people about the importance of the marine sanctuary and the importance of wildlife viewing etiquette. That is, you know, not getting too close to the animals and not bothering them. So it'd be great to have Lisa come on and talk about that. If you could set that up, that would be absolutely wonderful, Paul. We really, yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Speaking of things that are always going on yeah. at, at the sanctuary, the the, the Shimada, it, today, it, I believe, is the 25th of July, is the last day that the Noah ship Bell M. Shimada right. is out at Davidson Seamount. Could you talk to us about that? Please? Yeah, they just got in last night, actually. Oh. They just spent uh, nine days out over the Davidson Seamount. Uh, and remarkable because they had incredible weather. Usually, it's, you know, the Davidson Seamount is you know, 80, 90 miles offshore, and it's real rough water typically. The wind is always blowing out there, but they had remarkable weather, uh, which is great for marine mammal and seabird observations, right? It's hard to see whales and seabirds when the water's just a white foam, right? right? So, but they mm -hmm. had great uh, weather conditions mm -hmm. and pulled off some amazing uh, science out there. Now, um, did, did they use a drone? I remember once when the Shimada was out here, they were using a drone, uh, 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 launching a drone right. off the deck. Did, they, did they do that this they time? They didn't do that this drones? time. Did not do that this uh -huh. time. Um, we had some different things we were doing this time, uh, studying microplastics, that is, you know, the small particles of plastic that are uh, becoming ubiquitous in our world's oceans. So mm -hmm. d uh, using a trawl to just trawl through the water and see what kinds of little bits of plastic we can pick up. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done some water quality, other water quality tests testing out there. We've done some soundscape work, so listening to what does the Davidson Seamount sound like? What are the creatures that are there and can we listen to them? Can we pinpoint maybe where they are and maybe species? So that was really interesting as well. And so you you were you had some what hydrophones down there? Yes, or hydrophones, they right, mm -hmm. right, right. And we're mm -hmm. also looking at krill because krill is you know the base of the food web, uh, which really drives the ecosystem in many places, but especially the Davidson Seamount because this underwater mountain just rises up off the deep ocean seafloor. So mm -hmm. ocean currents that hit that and rise to the surface carry that nutrient rich water, cold water, which makes the phytoplankton bloom, the krill feed on that, and then animals come from all over to feed on that krill. Whales, porpoises, dolphins, fish, seabirds. It's like an oasis out in the middle of the ocean, really. When you come to the Davidson Seamount, you know you're getting close because all of a sudden you start seeing all this wildlife mm -hmm. out in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then, then when you go below the surface, uh, it's kind of amazing too, as I recall from some pictures I've seen. Yes, well, the, the seamount itself is mm -hmm. about 26 miles long by mm -hmm. about eight miles wide, and it's just covered with uh, corals and sponges, some as big and beautiful as you and I. Well, I, I, I don't know how beautiful I am, but I am definitely <laughs> big, you know, especially around the stomach. Hey, um, and now those are old, they call them old growth coral or yeah, something? Yeah, they, they take, some of them take hundreds of years to reach their maximum size. So we really refer to them as the old growth forests of the ocean. Now, Paul, you, you mentioned that there were a lot of different studies done. Mm -hmm. At one point, as I recall, uh, you were linking with the, the Shimada, and this was years ago, uh, so that people could see on their computers 
what things were looking like out there. Did you do any of that linking up? And, we and did some social media and blogging. Okay. Uh, this fall, we're going to be on Bob Ballard's ship, the, the Nautilus, doing some exploration. And we're going to be doing some live work from the, because that's really what they do. They specialize in live broadcast. Uh, so we'll be doing that this fall, and we'll have to hook you up with, with folks that are involved with that mission to come on this show to talk about, th talk about what we're going to be doing there. That would be tremendous, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm trying to remember if we had uh, uh, Mr. B uh, Captain Ballard on, on, on the show before, but so he, is, is he bringing his ship here to the bay? Uh, they will be, uh, we'll actually be focusing our work in the southern part of the sanctuary because it is the okay. least explored and least mapped. Okay. Uh, and so that's where we're going to be doing the majority of our work. So, so kind of offshore of San Simeon, uh -huh. Cambria, that area, way, okay. way offshore, yes. Uh, that's yeah. big time stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, now, is, now yeah. uh, remind our audience what types of things uh, uh, Mr. Ballard has been into. Uh, well, his most famous, you know, notoriety is the discovery of the Titanic, mm -hmm. well, a little bit of important <laughs> uh, history. Uh, and so, yeah, he's a world-renowned ocean explorer. And that yeah. ship, the Nautilus, is yeah. just a technological wonder yes, as is. far as uh, sea, ocean exploration. It is. And videotaping, uh, not vi well, recording, right, I should say. Right, right. Recording your yeah. data. Yeah. So that's going to happen in the fall. In the fall. That that's is right. very, very yes. exciting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Something brand new. That's, that's right. wonderful. Yeah. Now, Paul, you mentioned citizen science. How important is citizen science? And, 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 and if I may preface yeah, this. Yeah. I was I was at the, I went down at the Sillamore along the sanctuary yeah. this past weekend, and and uh, I saw some people who were observing uh, something. I talked to them briefly. Yeah. They were watching the oyster ca an oyster catcher bird yeah. couple yeah. Uh, nest. Yeah, and I it, it's amazing how many people are dedicating their weekends, their nights, their right. off time mm -hmm. to citizen science. How right. important is that to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary? Well, it's very important on, on really on two fronts. The science excel, itself, the mm -hmm. data and information that's collected, but also I, I like it because it involves citizens, right? I mean, that, that's really what sanctuaries are about. They're about engaging and connecting with our communities and getting people involved in the actual management, the actual science. Uh, and, and advisory uh, capacities to the sanctuary. So citizen science is really important, uh, whether it's water quality monitoring, whether it's our beachcomber program. Uh, there's a, a lot of ways to, to get involved uh, in, in the sanctuary and citizen science. And it's, it's very important now because we've got close to 20 years of citizen science data. So we can start to see trends. We can start to see where there's problem areas. And without, it's really a cadre of volunteers in citizen science going on, we wouldn't have that information. And that, the engagement is just incredible, yeah. too. And, and citizen scientists obviously are more engaged. Yeah. They talk to people. They get other people engaged. That's right. And, and, yeah. and so on and so on as the old commercial is to go. Yes. I think it was a Clairol commercial. I shouldn't. But anyway. I You're giving away your beauty <laughs> secrets. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I, was, I love working with you. Now, what is, is this, you wanted to talk a little bit about ecotourism? Or what yes, I mean, sanctuaries are all about visiting and exploring, and we want people to come here and see this amazing place, whether it's the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary or other sanctuaries, but we want people to be here and doing that in a responsible manner. So we talk a lot about wildlife etiquette, wildlife viewing, uh, so being here and being stewards of the environment as well as enjoying it. And so how do we do that? Well, we're involving the, you know, the tourism industry and, mm -hmm. and, and businesses like hotels okay. and restaurateurs and people okay. are inviting people to come here, want business to come here. Uh, we want to see that in a sustainable manner. So this is a really interesting and exciting initiative going on right now, uh, headed up by CSUMB and the business school there and their ecotourism initiative involving, like I said before, businesses in the tourism sector here, hospitality sector here, in the okay. greater Monterey Bay area, so Santa Cruz all the way to Monterey. Okay. To, and the vision is, and this is pretty bold, mm -hmm. is to make the Monterey Bay the ecotourism and wellness region in the United States. Wow. And so we really want to emulate what's done in other places around the world, mm -hmm. like Costa Rica, what's just all about sustainable tourism. We want to see that here, whether it's from transportation and water use and uh, wildlife viewing, all things that would make this area really shine nationally as the place where ecotourism is done and done responsibly. What a great vision that is, yeah. Paul, I, and, and it just fits right in with, with the sanctuary. Yeah. And you're talking about ecotourism and the hospitality industry. Isn't there a hotel that's going to be special like, going to be specializing in that? 
uh, being built right now, or am I mistaken? Well, they're all sort of moving in that direction. Oh, okay. And I think it's, it, I mean, it's, it's good business. It's sure. Good, you know, the public, as they become more informed and aware of mm -hmm. the importance of uh, green practices and sustainability, they want to spend their dollars in places that are doing that kind of, they're, they're operating that way. Absolutely. And so hotels and restaurants that are marketing themselves as sanctuary friendly or, you know, ecotourism, sustainable friendly, mm -hmm. that, that's the direction that we're going. Now, it, has it got, will it get to the point where people are actually volunteering on their vacation to work um, for their favorite uh, uh, environmental <laughs> No, we're seeing some of that. Really? Actually, when um, we have maybe some big conferences that come here from corporations, mm -hmm. uh, depending upon the corporation and their, how long they're here, uh, we've been contacted at times and other environmental organizations with a question about what can we do to help? What, is there a project? That, can we go clean a beach? Can we do a creek cleanup? Uh, right. what, what can we do? We want to get our folks, instead of sitting around in a you know, neon lit conference room talking mm -hmm. about their business for a week, can, we, they, can, can they get out and do something for the benefit of the community and the environment? So we're seeing more and more of that as uh, corporate responsibility and, and actual the, wor the workers want to do this kind of thing as part of their, their planning and of their symposiums. Yeah. Great. Yeah. What, what, a, what a wonderful thing that to happen, especially around here. And I congratulate you on that vision of making us the, the, the ecotourism wellness capital of the United States. No, may, and, may, and, and was there something else you wanted to follow up with that? Because if not, I've got a question. Well, we are planning to do a uh, the second of two conferences. There was one last November. We're doing a conference in January of 2019, a uh, ecotourism conference here locally. And so stay tuned for that. We're going to bring in uh, the vice president and former president of Costa Rica as one of the speakers uh, and speakers from around the country that are doing similar efforts in other places in the country to, so we can learn from what works uh, and try to emulate that here. So stay tuned for that. So the sanctuary is actually going to be involved in, in putting on this conference? Or well, really, or it's being led up by the business school at CSUMB, oh, okay. and uh, we're just a part of that. What's cool about the sanctuary's role mm -hmm. is that everyone has seen the value of the sanctuary sort of being the backdrop yes. and the reason why when we want to have ecotourism done sustainably here. So that's the role, really, the sanctuary is playing. That's yeah. wonderful news. Yeah. It's great to watch things progress. And yeah. Paul, I want to thank you so much for being on here. Thanks for getting in Absolutely. touch with Lisa Emanuelson and sending her over to the show. Look forward oh, yeah. to meeting with her. And please come back and see us. We've got a lot of great guests. I know we've got a couple opportunities where you're going to be sitting in this chair and oh, interviewing good. some, some good. famous people, because I know you're great at that. Yeah. So thanks again for coming on the show. My pleasure. And uh, uh, we will see you soon. And we're going to take a very, very, very short break. But we'll be right back. Thanks for watching.